This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, we're really excited about this series and we were most excited to kick it off with this one. Uh, I get to share the screen with one of my friends, colleagues, and mentors, uh, Frank, Dr. Frank Rossi, Associate Professor of Horticulture at Cornell University. He's laughing now, but um, <laughs> uh, I want to give a little background on our relationship and how it started and then turn it over to Frank so he can tell you a little bit about the work that we're doing at Greenwood. Greenwood is well known for its living collection of trees and shrubs. Uh, we curate that collection, we manage it with data. It's a very data-driven management approach to how we curate it as well. Um, we're less known for the vegetation that's most dominant though at Greenwood, and that would be our turf grass. Um, Greenwood, as well as being an arboretum, is what we call an urban grassland. And an urban grassland is really any grass dominated space within an urban environment. It could be your ball fields, Central Park, Prospect Park, any of these places where turf grass is the dominant vegetation would be considered an urban grassland. What we started noticing around 2015 were that our traditional methods of managing our urban grassland from mowing to um, chemical approach, uh, approaches with herbicide to manage um, unwanted vegetation that weren't working. We weren't seeing the control we wanted on invasive plants, specifically Bermuda grass, which is a warm season grass, and Frank will talk about that later. But we were noticing a grass that was steadily taking over the landscape, and none of our approaches were working. We were also noticing that mowing caused damage to our monuments. It wasn't effectively um, maintaining the landscape from eroding further, and we knew that we needed someone who had more knowledge about turf grass, especially in urban environments than we did. So we, we I wrote Frank in 2015, an email um, I have here, but I won't read it. I, I gave him a lot of praise. I tried to butter him up. He took uh, two years to, to get back to me. I had consistently called him throughout this period of time and he just would uh, reject me every time. Finally, I, I convinced him to come down while he was coming for another trip. And he saw the extent of the problem. Greenwood is 478 acres, largely dominated by turf grass. And it's really showing the effects of climate change on our stand of turf grass and how we manage it. We wanted to create a data-driven management style for managing our turf grass, similar to what we've developed for our arboretum. And we also wanted to lessen our environmental impact that's an inevitability with mowing and mechanical mowing and herbicide approaches. So we started a partnership uh, three years ago now with Cornell University, uh, studying Greenwood as an urban grassland and doing applied research. And now it is my pleasure to turn it over to Frank Rossi, Dr. Frank Rossi. Thank you very much, Joe. What a joy it's been for me to, uh, to... I ignored you the best I could there for a while. I was doing as best I could giving you the treatment and, and uh, your persistence was, uh, I think has paid off for everybody. And I'm hoping that everyone sees that by the time we're done here in the next 40, 45 minutes or so. So uh, thank you very much uh, all everyone for joining me, uh, us here, as we all navigate this uh, incredibly difficult time of which uh, Greenwood is really at the epicenter of. And uh, you know, the fascinating thing about what's going on right now is the relevancy of Greenwood in obvious in the obvious sense, right? The relevancy of a cemetery landscape in the obvious way where so many people are losing their lives. But at the same time, the the demand that Greenwood is facing for, for as a haven, as a green space, is is obviously driving uh, serious concerns uh, to the point where, hey, we're going to need help to control this. Now, this wasn't at Greenwood, but but this speaks to, to me, the sort of pent-up demand uh, urban populations and urbanism has for those green spaces. And you know, I've been watching the, you know, a little more time on my hands, uh, watching a little, uh, I've been watching the Ken Burns documentary of, of New York City. I'd commend it to many of you that really don't have a background of sort of how New York City sort of at least from Ken Burns' perspective came about. And you see how these spaces uh, 
you know, maybe weren't originally designed for everybody when they came about, but boy, are they for everybody now. And when you look at the modern scientific discourse about the way humans are interacting with their urban environment, you, you, you can study things that are allowing us to see the way we feel about these things. And, you know, you can look in a paper like this published last year about people tweeting out of the parks and in the different boroughs. And one of the things that's fascinating in here is the happiest tweets came out of Brooklyn. There's a most of the positive tweets came from being in a park and most of those tweets in those parks uh, were in the borough of Brooklyn. Uh, interestingly, there were more out of park tweets uh, in Manhattan about parks and, and they weren't always very positive. So it's a very interesting way of looking at the way we interact with our, with our green spaces uh, in heavily urbanized areas. Now, we are uh, confronting at the same time that the demand is very high, uh, what's looking like a very dire situation. If you simply look at this most recent article in the Architects newspaper here, uh, over 150 acres of lawns, untrimmed, uh, unplanted trees, branches and hazards. What people don't realize about parks and green space and that Joe is really a pioneer in his own way in the cemetery world, they don't give a second thought many times to the grasses, to the trees, to the plants, right? I mean, if you look at ways a lot of cemeteries are laid out in rows to make them very efficiently managed, but when you look at the estate plots that are found in rural cemeteries like Greenwood, it adds a level of complexity even greater than what a normal park would face. And you know, you wouldn't consider, okay, well, you know, if the pipes are leaking, we're not going to fix them. Well, the air condition doesn't work. It seems to be doing this. Well, we're not going to fix it, right? And so, so, you know, you wouldn't think of not doing that in a building, right? But, but we think about it all the time. Well, somehow green space takes care of itself. Well, I'll just introduce myself to you uh, if you're not aware, you know, familiar with who we are at Cornell University. I'm myself as the project director and a background both as an academic and as a consultant. Uh, my current colleague, Lowell Chamberlain, uh, our research coordinator, uh, comes from a forestry background and a Peace Corps background, uh, is on site there down in Greenwood uh, with the funding from the Greenwood Foundation. And of course, the partnerships we have with Joe and Sarah Evans, the manager of horticulture operations. It's been a, just a joy working with these folks. And furthermore, I'd say in a real homage to the long history of Greenwood, uh, this, this is a staff uh, dedicated and taking great pride in their work. This is a hardworking group of people uh, that are really having to confront uh, a lot of these challenges on the ground. I mean, the people that are planting the grass are seeing, yeah, you know, it's not working out like it used to, or, or boy, we see the, you know, it just looks, doesn't look like it used to. And you wonder, and you know, we know everybody's working hard. It's just, we're facing some challenges that are making it more difficult. And really the basis of what I think we've started here at Greenwood is, is a whole collection of partnerships, partnerships around urban grasslands that engage the expertise that we have in the natural world, uh, not just in Greenwood, but our project involves uh, professors from the University of Tennessee, the University of Wisconsin, uh, the Uni Oregon State University, Oklahoma State University. We've got a lot of universities now just starting to notice what we're building here at Greenwood and expecting and hoping for long-term partnerships. So what is the goal of this? And Joe introduced it to a certain extent. We've got a serious issue with Bermuda grass that's invading the landscape. Talk about that. And we're noticed that as the climate's changing, we'd like to not contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. We try to find a way to get the landscape and greenwood, the grassland at greenwood, to service the urban environment. And part of doing that is reducing our reliance on regular mowing. How can we be more systematic about our uh, mowing so that it results in an overall reduction? Now, the, you know, what I fear uh, when, when I saw and as I've learned about Greenwood and what Joe picked up on immediately and, and it's been, you know, obvious to people in the Secretary, people who pay attention to plants um, notice is it, can somebody mute themselves? Thank you. Um, 
when you um, you looking at Greenwood really suffering the death by a thousand cuts, you know, little things like south facing slopes that get some grub damage, uh, soil insects that start to degrade. This area gets very difficult to mow. Obviously, you see the chipping away of the stones that happens from the mechanical mowing because this landscape wasn't designed to really withstand mechanical mowing. Okay, so what does it mean to manage Greenwood uh, Cemetery in an era of climate change? So let's, let's take this apart a little bit. And we'll go all the way to the United Nations and, and who did a wonderful job back at the turn of the century looking at, okay, we're part of this natural world. And boy, are we learning that in, in, in a greater way all the time, whether it's a global pandemic or what we now see as the real precursors to a climate in transition. And the UN said, listen, we, we need to understand this better of how the natural world services us so, and how we're impacting that in a way that's having a negative effect on us, that we simply can't continue to think the path forward is increasing GDP, that the only measure of our success is in increasing GDP. There has to be more of a donut economics approach uh, put to it that's looking at sustaining these things that we need because as we're figuring out fixing them when they break is not so easy so in that context we have this millennium ecosystems report that concept was then translated into managing urban grasslands by my colleague jenny gow niffin and her graduate student now a professor at iowa state university grant thompson about ecosystem services. What are the ways that grasslands like Greenwood service us? They, they protect us from certain things. They regulate certain things. They give us areas for mental health. They help the soil build. They move nutrients through. They produce, a, they, they fix carbon and store it in the soil, right? There's so many aspects to what these grasslands are doing beyond simply allowing us to walk out there pleasurably. Now, these things have started to be monetized. It's a progressive idea coming out of Denmark. What's our willingness to pay for certain green infrastructure benefits like recreation and visual attractiveness, right? Flood protection, right? Stormwater management. Look at where grass strips are involved and look at the benefits you get from stormwater management. If nothing else, it provides, Greenwood provides 470 acres of infiltration into the ground, possible infiltration of water into the ground, the recreation that you see, the carbon storage in the soil, right? Traffic and noise reduction, air purification. How much are you willing to pay? How much do you value these things? These are the kinds of studies that places like the New School can do. Brooklyn College and the Urban Soil Institute can start to look at these ecosystem services that grasslands can provide that can be monetized and valued in a way that helps their upkeep be as progressive as it possibly can be. Now, as Joe said, urban grasslands are really centered around urban centers. If you look at this paper from 2007 by NASA scientists, where they did spectral imaging, trying to find out where the natural turf grass was in America, you see very clearly it's associated with urban population centers that are also intimately associated with impervious surfaces. So where climate change is impacting our society the greatest and the fastest in the urban areas, we have the greatest impact of impervious surfaces with the heat island effect and the potential benefit that grasslands can provide. So we've got a really a perfect storm here that's leading to fairly significant increases, fairly significant increases in temperatures, right? I don't have to remind you that the world is warming now. <laughs> in great irony, the, the, our part of the world seems to be cooling uh, in a very interesting way. And there's easily, act, there's actually ways of explaining some of this cool weather that came through uh, around some of the climate uh, change that's happening and amplification of these cold effects at certain times. There's this whole study of uh, the concept of fall spring that's incredibly fascinating. Okay, let's uh, get back to what we're talking about here. So the climate's changing. Greenwood is important. 
the grasslands are really not noticed, but have enormous value beyond what's obvious. And what we're noticing, and I think what brought Joe to me was this widespread infestation of warm season grasses. These are grasses that grow very differently than the grasses we normally find in northern climates. If you look beyond this uh, browning area here, if you look right past here, out in here, these are the cool season grasses. These are bluegrasses, ryegrasses, fine fescues, orchard grass, um, variety of turf grasses that have been planted out there over the years purposely. And then you get in here and you see the brown grass, not the green grass in there, but these large expanses of dormant brown grass. This happens to be a warm season grass, right? And it sort of gets in and you can see how it spreads and starts to take over and gives the landscape a very uh, distinguished, different appearance than we're used to. Now, the primary species that we find out there is a cynodon species introduced from Southeast Asia and the Caribbean, probably came in on in the ballast of slave ships that we brought up uh, from the Caribbean at the time. And it probably got put out there. Now, there's other ways it could have got out there as well as loved ones might have brought grasses from other places. But again, this picture in the March-April window time frame, you see not many leaves on the trees, the transition of the winter coming out. And you see a landscape virtually covered in this warm season grass. And in fact, in doing some of the modeling we've started to do on the landscape at Greenwood, we're noticing that the, war, the cardinal temperature, the current models are indicating that the average temperatures in Brooklyn since 1965, combined with the lack of chilling temperatures, have allowed these grasses to, to grow uh, unabated for much longer periods of time than they were doing prior to this 1965 period. And so we've partnered with a weather uh, sensor and forecast and uh, growth modeling company and analytics company, uh, installing sensors in the Greenwood landscape and developing and characterizing these microclimates. We, we know that the elevation creates a unique climate in these situations. And so we're trying to study it on a more detailed level so that when we find and establish the populations of these plants at Greenwood and we can correlate it with microclimate, and then use that data to drive our management of this invasive species moving forward. Now, what that's meant, first off, is you've got to understand your enemy here. You know, this is a plant that will grow about oh, an inch, inch and a half a day. You can get six to eight inches a week. Uh, we've measured as much as 14 inches over 10 days uh, with some plants. And we do that by establishing some uh, experiments in some remote areas on the cemetery where we carve out an area, we put the plants in, and we go out there on a regular basis and measure the growth and spread. And in doing this, we're looking at not just how it grows during the season and how it will spread, but how does the way we handle the soil at Greenwood potentially impact this. And already we've started to notice that there's a microclimate effect as well as a soil effect, right? We've noticed that the darker soils that the plants and grasses establish more quickly in uh, allow the Bermuda grass to establish more rapidly. So we see a fairly rapid spread of Bermuda grass based on the way we're handling the soil. And so now we wanna go back and think about adjusting the way we handle the soil at Greenwood. A, a, a companion study going on in a nearby area is looking at after we bury or when there's perpetual care management done that requires new seeding, how does the methods that we're using and new methods potentially impact the establishment and invasion potential of, of uh, Bermuda grass. Because of the rate at which we disturb the ground here and the competitive advantage that that disturbance gives the Bermuda grass, we've got to find ways, number one, to know how and when and what impacts Bermuda grass growth, and then 
how and when and what are the best strategies for encouraging cool season grasses to be the dominant species there. Because over time, it may be, if the climate keeps changing over the next 50 years as we anticipate, that the Bermuda grass and these other grasses might be the ideal species, but right now they're leading to increased mowing, increased uh, water use, increased weediness. So there's a number of aspects of having Bermuda grass out there that create some additional challenges. So these methods of understanding mat and containing it uh, integrated into the Greenwood management system is critical for us. So uh, Bermuda grass growth rate increases its competitiveness in microclimates that favor its growth. That's what we've already began to see. And we're beginning to see that our soil handling strategy is influencing the spread and establishment of this plant. So we're currently working on developing specifications so that Greenwood will be able to do this in an improved way because of the amount of disturbance that occurs, the complications that are involved there, the amount of disturbance and reestablishment that has to happen as a general rule, we number one are trying to minimize that disturbance. And here in the background, you can see another invasion of that warm season grass. This is the ravine path, you know, that had to get fixed after Superstorm Standy. And so every time we start disturbing and planting, we're putting in new grasses. So well, what's the best grass to put in? So we established an, uh, an experiment on the Wisteria area of Greenwood uh, this past fall. And, and our goal was to identify appropriate urban grassland vegetation for these highly disturbed locations mm -hmm. that have a high level of invasive plant pressure. And you can see in the background there, uh, the species that we're putting in uh, from normal, you know, Kentucky bluegrass and low input, low growing fescues, tall fescue, that's a more drought tolerant, uh, traffic tolerant species, some native grass mixes to Long Island and the native area there, some pasture mixes that might be what they would have planted back in the 1800s, and then some bent grass mixes that were very common when we were planting lawns in our early phases in the early 1900s uh, that we've noticed when you have a lot of bent grass, you don't get a lot of other weedy plants in there. In fact, bent grass competes very effectively uh, with Bermuda grass. And so we're trying it experimentally out there as well. So we established um, the new area in Wisteria. We've got a fair amount of data and imagery from that establishment. And this is the, the typical plot that we plant uh, with the mix we've designed for Greenwood. You can see it's almost at 80% cover about 34 days after when it's planted in the fall. So, you know, obviously if you can plant all your grass at an ideal time, we think we're gonna have a competitive advantage. The issue is we're planting grass over a three to four month period in the fall and a two month period in the spring. And it makes it complicated to have to continue to battle that Bermuda grass. We've taken some really good data to show the differences uh, across the board there, just to give you a little bit of, can't have a scientific presentation without a little bit of data. And so there is the finished uh, product right now that we'll be monitoring uh, throughout uh, the year. Uh, we've been approved by Cornell University and Lowell, uh, who's our uh, on-site research director there, to continue to take the data uh, for this project. So we're looking forward to that. Now, let's talk about mowing, right? Because this is clearly uh, a big aspect of uh, once we are studying the Bermuda grass and resurfacing and soil handling and new varieties and we get our arms around managing that grassland vegetation, now it's okay, mowing is a big thing. How can we be more sensitive to the climate and the landscape, right? Uh, you know, not disturb it as much, uh, not emit as much uh, fossil fuel emissions, uh, not damage the monuments. How can we use data to do that smartly? Well, we started out by saying, listen, <laughs> this is going to look different, right? And for those of you that might have visited Greenwood last year, you might have seen some of the early indications of what I'll talk about in a middle, minute, minute about our perpetual meadows. Uh, but we started a simple demonstration, getting some information out there about how much emissions we have and how much we can save and what it might look like. And you'll see this on the 
chapel lawn adjacent to the chapel lawn. But from a data perspective, um, you know, we were looking at GPS tracking. This is the internet of things, right? This is, we, we had to go to smart cities and golf course people to say, well, how can we do this? Even the contractor that we're using to manage our lands, mow our landscape, didn't have an in-place monitoring system uh, for their equipment. So we were really breaking new ground in the management of grasslands using this approach. And it, it, it required us to install uh, antennas and use a low RAN network. Now, I think we'll be moving to cellular technology soon, but we have a low RAN network where we've got sensors installed on the mowers that are tracking their movement throughout the property. So we can see on this day, uh, uh, May 28th of last year, that there were 12 pieces of equipment uh, that were out and about being worked. And if you just hone in on one particular island you can see that on May 28th island 4 was mowed but on May 29th it was not mowed right so as you start to look at this we're, we're starting to do this daily data driven mowing deployment right so we have the ability to determine the changes in mowing that happens how long does it take uh, the mowing contractor to come back to this area can we be more specific about how much we have to mow it, how frequently we have to mow it, how quickly the grass is growing? We're literally measuring the rate of grass growth. Now, last year, uh, in addition to our mowing work, uh, a big emphasis was placed on um, trying to cut back mowing. So our initial study uh, last year was about, was to put about 108 acres into not mowing them at all after the middle of June. Um, we put, took another 177 acres and said, how about we just mow that monthly uh, and then chain, and then we kept other ones at regular mowing and other banks and things like that. So we started an experiment last year uh, that, that had a, a fair amount of difficulty and, and really significantly uh, disrupted uh, sort of a lot of people's feeling about the cemetery. And there was a real difference between the way people viewed uh, what it is we were doing. And so uh, one of the things that we noticed was uh, certainly the people with loved ones there uh, who had lots, uh, had very strong feelings about, you know, I want this mowed. I need this more regularly manicured. This, this is a a pretty reasonable expectation that it should be mowed all the time. And then we have people who are joining Greenwood. And then the broader progressive question is, how can this massive green space be enhanced to create in pollinator services or by allowing it to grow taller in certain places, let the roots grow deeper so they can store carbon deeper in the profile, right? Are there ways to use these large expanses of grass, not just at Greenwood, but at Prospect Park, at Central Park, at Governor's Island, right? In Madison Square Park. Are there other places where we can reimagine these grasslands? And part of that is mowing them less. So our plan was to develop a, a standard for managing these meadows, right? I mean, you can see at this time of year in this picture, this is an aesthetically pleasing picture to many people, especially in the more historic parts of the cemetery. Right, But one of the challenges that we have is, is when we stopped mowing, we started to see, wow, look, look at this. These are, these are blue stems. These are native prairie grasses, grasses that are native to this area or have made it here from the grasslands. They're in there. Either birds have dropped them or somehow the seed was contaminated and got in there somehow. Maybe we brought soil in at some point that had it. But as we took back the mowing pressure, we noticed, wow, look at the flora that we have. Now, I looked at it like that. Other people are like, look, cut the grass. This isn't working, right? But we noticed that there were places throughout the cemetery where low, slow growing uh, grasses did not obscure the stones, did not distract they were uniform maybe they were taller but you could look across them and they didn't give you that sort of rattiness appearance that you might get uh some cases now here's an example of uh one of the challenges that we faced right 
in a lot of our meadows, you know, you've got different vegetation. Up close, you can see we have a newly planted area where the red arrow is. But then when you look out into the meadow, right, there were, there were obviously the kinds of challenges that we faced, right? Taller plants, uh, thick vegetation that was obscuring the stones, it's dense, it's not uniform. So we've made some adaptations to the management specifications that included the way we have to mow it, right? You know, when you start to change the management of a grassland, right? You're basically taking a system of, of professional landscape managers who are uh, uh, primarily paid to mow the landscape in a regular fashion. You go out every seven days, you, you know, everybody mows their lawn once a week. And the equipment is designed to manage the grasslands in that particular way. And when you try to make adaptations, whether it's a flowering lawn or not mowing it as much, a flowering lawn might, might limit herbicide options you could use. Uh, letting it grow taller and thicker might limit the equipments that you use. And so when we're doing this research, particularly in the practical setting, right, this is very much applied research that the land grant institution that I'm part of you know, what makes this such a powerful project is that we can not only say, well, yeah, let's not mow. We can try to help develop on the ground solutions with the mowing company say, listen, you got to get different equipment here. Uh, this isn't working. And so in working with them, right, we, we were able to get them to bring out different, try out different pieces of equipment that has resulted now in a very different look to these perpetual meadows that exist in the landscape um, and have been, uh, you know, I think very widely and effectively received. So now we have about 40 acres uh, of greenwood, about 10% of the grasslands uh, that represent these perpetual meadows that we're managing uh, to a uh, specification, right? We developed a specification that now becomes part of the management of Greenwood uh, moving forward. So we've been able to, uh, over time, number one, determine sort of what are the ways we can look at reducing mowing. And then where we're gonna try to create these meadows, there really aren't good specifications for the way to do these things in urban areas. I mean, some of these specifications exist for use on golf courses or in, or in restorative prairies and places like that, but you don't, don't see this kind of work done regularly uh, in urban areas. Now, I think Shirley Chisholm's Park uh, here in Brooklyn, the new state park, I think they're going to see more and more of these parks uh, really get into more native vegetation management, you know, and that's where it's really, you know, along a coastline or in a, a park setting that has this aesthetic built in that a meadow fits. Um, that's a bit easier than doing it in a cemetery where the demand has historically been that this Victorian view uh, of a very finely manicured, uh, regularly mowed landscape. So as I wrap up uh, for today, uh, I'm, I'm really grateful uh, to all the folks that we've been collaborating with and to Joe uh, around the various projects and and Sarah and 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 the previous uh, research direct uh, research manager uh, Andy Pachedli, you know this is a project that is working as you can see on many fronts um, that we've been trying to co-opt as much uh, uh, expertise uh, around the country to bring it to bear on something that really has been I think primarily uh, ignored greatly. Uh, over the last several decades. So I'll thank uh, my colleague and pal, Joe Charip for, for bringing me on board all those years ago, uh, convincing me to come down. Uh, Greenwood is in fact, one of the great treasures uh, of the United States and certainly of New York City. So um, I've been really pleased to work with, work with you guys. And, and I think we're just scratching the surface here. I think we've just begun to understand what are the right grasses, what are the right methods, what are the right strategies and adaptations we have to make. And I think the reason it's important is now that the public has recognized the value of these spaces, they're going to need even more uh, attention. And I fear if we just try to take the way we've always done things and bring it with us into a post-COVID world, 
we're going to create more problems that we're going to solve. So the progressive types of things that we've begun to research at Greenwood really aren't answering too many questions yet. But I believe as a good scientist, we're starting to ask the right questions. And by asking the right questions, we got a better chance of getting answers that will help us moving forward. So thank you, Joe. I'm happy to take some questions uh, from the folks and we can yak about uh, anything moving forward here. Thank you very much, Frank. That was terrific. Um, really summed all the stuff we're doing up pretty neatly there, so that's great. Um, we have one question so far. Uh, what is the difference between the black soil that is added and the native soil? The black soil that is added is imported uh, from a local topsoil source where there's compost and soil blended. It's a very commonly used uh, soil additive in the New York metropolitan area uh, in the lawn and landscape. If you'll hear it referred to colloquially as Long Island gold, New York gold. Um, there, there's a whole aspect of the soil question that's fascinating. Now, when you get through, uh, so that's what that black soil is. The native soil is very interesting because the native soil has had grass growing on it for 200 years. And when you look at the soil classification, it's not well classified. It's classified primarily as by urban green belt or urban outwash and simply the elevation change. We've been working with the Soil Conservation Service and Richard Shaw, the New Jersey State Soil Scientist, uh, to, they're trying to characterize these soils much like they did at Prospect Park. The native soils are anywhere from uh, thick, silty loams in some areas to a, a gravelly, outwashy, sandy material. You have the terminal moraine there where flatbush starts and the outwash where the, where the water receded and the, the water receded and the glacier moved on uh, from that point at the top uh, of Greenwood where the soils change. Uh, but the, the soil itself, when you, when you bury someone and you use the underlying material, that isn't really soil. It's a long way of me saying the native soil isn't really soil as we call it. It's mostly subsoil. It's mostly the bee horizon that is there after the burial that the black soil is added to. Now, and the grass grows on it for 200 years, it gets really good and rich um, and, and can sustain a, a grass fairly effectively. But it's also filled with weed seeds and Bermuda grass plants. And so we've been trying to figure out how to deal with that topsoil. Long answer to a short question, huh, Joe? Well, we can go on to the soil science section of this uh, talk in a moment. But uh, so two questions similar, and then we have a third here. The first is, can you talk a bit about bringing lot owners and visitors around to this new aesthetic? And the next is, how do you get family members to change their mindset as far as mowing is concerned? Um, Joe, neither one of those are questions for me, brother. Well, no, those I are can, questions I for you. I can try to answer them. Um, well, let me say why they're not questions for me and why this brings up a very interesting problem. I'm a plant scientist, and I think I've chosen, I know I've chosen to study plants because I have a very difficult time trying to understand people. I have a wife and kids, and I understand people at that level, but trying to understand them are the kinds of things I leave to, I think, people who study sociology and human behavior, and there's a whole area of research around this as a scientist that we could use some collaboration on, but I'd let Joe to speak to the way they've sort of been dealing with that at Greenwood for sure. I, I, I'd say that I don't think we did it um, well enough the first round. I think the way to effectively do this is to communicate early and often with lot owners about our intent and the reason for our, our, our intervention to the landscape are primarily motivated by our desire to preserve the landscape. These are not trying new things for the sake of experimentation. They are for the purpose of maintaining the landscape as the environment changes, allowing the landscape to be, be there for their loved ones, for whomever, as we continue to see these changes. So 
I think that having an effective communication strategy and getting out there long before the interventions are made is the best way to do it. Also aligning this with the conservation component of the site. But there are some people whose minds you'll never change. Some people, you know, complained to, to me and said, you know, I, I like what you're doing. I, I, climate change is real. I give to environmental causes, but don't do this on my lot. And I think for that constituency, it's gonna be very difficult for us to convince them that our interventions are appropriate throughout the landscape. But there will be some opportunities where we can use these methods where there won't be as much of a negative response. And for those people who are willing to consider that the benefits outweigh some of the aesthetic challenges that they might perceive, I think that's, they are able to be persuaded more readily. I don't know if that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, you know, I think there are just a whole bunch of people that just, that, wait a minute, cut the grass. That if you're not cutting the grass, you're neglecting the site. So I think it's important that you say, and we communicate, we're doing this as a means of preservation because this landscape wasn't set up for the intensity of mowing that's happening, especially with, with the productivity and the drive to productively mow this complex landscape uh, and preserve these stones and the sensitive slopes and topographical features. It, they're just not as compatible as maybe they used to have been in the past. And the assumption that we really tried to directly combat last year was that we were doing less by not mowing as much. In fact, we've never studied the landscape more thoroughly than we did when we started changing the way we mowed. We, we knew every, every island, every acre of that space and how it was reacting. We had to have a more comprehensive, holistic vision of the site, which allowed us to really understand all of its intricacies and then apply more specific methods of, of control and intervention to those different areas. It wasn't, we're no longer doing a cookie cutter approach to the landscape. We're really trying to take it as, um, yeah. as a, a challenging landscape that has some areas that are very different from each other. Well, and I, th I would just say what, what I thought you were gonna say and what you've said to me all along is we want a data driven approach. Right? I mean, we're never going to get away, away from someone's intuitive sense to manage something, but a, a complex landscape like Greenwood has to be able to quantify certain aspects of it that we can do in a more efficient way. And, and that's going to conflict at some point with the socialized aesthetic. That's one of the ecosystem services that these landscape provides. If someone comes out there and they're upset, by what they see, well, then that thing isn't servicing the landscape, isn't servicing them the same way. Whether we can change their mind or make those adaptations in the management um, is still what we're researching. And I, I, finally, I think that the, the easiest way to sort of do this is to listen to people's complaints and to yeah. hear them and, and learn from them. I think we've learned a great deal from feedback that we've received, positive and negative, from lot owners here, and it's Agreed. informed what we've done. So. Um, Feedback in general has been really helpful for us. Excellent. Um, next question. This is from Adam. I assume that the concept of native grass may change with climate change as flora from more southern climes begin to establish themselves permanently at higher latitudes. Are we looking more toward the north, northward migration of ecosystems or the collapse of ecosystems and species or some combination? Yeah, that's a great question. It's likely to be some combination, right? Because you know, we don't really know the specialized relationships that these cool season grasses that have been here for 200 years and, you know, have developed with regard to the, to the soils and, the, and the, the, plant, the other plant material around them. For sure, we are expecting a northward advance. We are expecting, I don't think we're expecting a collapse, but what worries me is as we warm and we get these other plants in, the management of that system is going to drive up emissions if we're not strategically trying to manage that transition effectively. We're, I, I, I think the, the, best, the best writing on, on this sort of change with these ecosystems that these different species 
talk about has been really around pests, right? I, I don't know if Bermuda grass is, I don't know I'd call it a complete pest yet because we know it, there might be a role for it at some point. Uh, it just sometimes uh, it doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't allow, it has invasive properties. Now, I'll say this and I'll tee it up for Joe. Part of the problem that we're having is we've lost tree canopy. One of the things that's dr driving this invasion is the increased penetration of sunlight into these systems. So the, the problem is from an ecosystem perspective, this thing wants to evolve back to a hardwood forest of some sort, right? And I personally would like it to, uh, because I know overall that's going to make the grasslands, you know, quite a bit easier to manage because that's the grassland that will work in partnership. As soon as the canopy, the tree canopy develops again, the warm season grass problem will be reduced uh, significantly. So the way to manage that transition is to do what we're doing on the ground from a systems perspective, but at the same time empower Joe and the horticultural staff to strategically increase our canopy cover again. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, that's, this is one of the reasons beyond, behind one of our, our, our aggressive reproach, approach to replanting areas that have, are typically um, covered in Bermuda grass, but also have the absence of shade. We're trying to reestablish shade there, both by a combination of overstory and understory trees there, to reflect the rest of the aesthetic throughout Greenwood, which aren't, isn't these sort of open savanna areas. It's, it's, it's wooded areas with openings, and we're trying to basically reestablish those in areas that haven't had them. Um, and the benefits are shade, which have a myriad of benefits on our turf grass as well. Um, so, next question. How much is the support of native insect and bird populations taken into account in determining the management of the perpetual meadows? Uh, great question, and not yet. Um, not yet. Uh, that is where we're going. Again, as a, as a grass person, <laughs> I've learned to stay in my lane enough to be able to stabilize that meadow so that plants can be strategically introduced. Phase two of the meadow management, I definitely foresee us using plants that we know uh, people who are, can tell us about pollinator movement and bird activity in this area, what we can offer. Now, I'll say this. This has been a prominent area of study in, in, in my traditional lawn uh, research as well, where we're seeing by holding mowing back longer in the spring, we're getting these spring ephemerals, these things that flower in lawns that don't flower anywhere else. Same in the fall. If we let the winter annuals or, the, or some other plants that are coming up in the spring, we may get some more productivity out of these plants from an ecosystem's perspective. The challenge is to maintain a long period of diverse uh, flowering foraging plants uh, that are there all the time, that, that just don't collapse. What we're trying to do is to get the weediness that, that disrupts those uh, things uh, under control and then introduce the ones because the, the ones that we want. And anybody that studies this, this does not happen by accident. I mean, the ki these kinds of systems, these planned, managed systems in these urban environments, you know, to a certain extent, I listen to my, my colleague, Nina Basic that tells me native schmative sometimes. Let's get plants that function the way we want them and do what we want them to do uh, in these heavily designed and managed environments that can service the birds and the bees. So I, I don't really, you know, the answer is we're hoping. Uh, but there's a lot of thought involved to doing it intentionally. And the best way for us to be able to measure that improvement is by the gathering of data in advance. So we, we right. completed a comprehensive wildlife survey um, a few years ago, and we're using that as a baseline to determine the increase in the richness of species on site from birds to lepidoptera, butterflies, and moths. Um, and native bees, we're also in, Sarah Evans is, is in the midst of a native bee survey with uh, colleagues from the American Museum of Natural History. So we're gathering that baseline data so that we'll be able to understand how these interventions enhance uh, their Excellent. presence on site. Excellent. Um, 
Frank, is it okay to walk on the established grass at Greenwood? Sit on the grass? Yes, it is. Absolutely, positively, without question. Agreed. Is Greenwood the only cemetery you're working with on these matters? I, I should hope so, Frank. You have time to work with <laughs> Greenwood them. is the only cemetery that I am working with on these matters. Yes, there is, yeah. Only room for one cemetery. Right now. And, but what, listen, you know, we're joking, but I can tell you, talk about an industry that needs some disruption. Uh, I have spent my entire professional career disrupting the golf industry. You wouldn't think one person would spend time doing that. But for 30 years, we've been studying doing it with less pesticides, doing it with less nutrients, doing it with less water. And it's, I think it has only been economic crises and now a global pandemic that's brought attention to a lot of the research I've spent my time and life doing. The disruption of the cemetery industry is a much different type of disruption. It's a socio-cultural thing uh, with the public more than it is uh, as much as it is with the management of those cemeteries. There's a very cookie cutter way these landscapes are historically managed. And Joe is uh, one of the few uh, that are looking at it progressively, willing to take the complaints and grow from it. And I think an uh, active participant in the rural cemetery folks with our pal up there at, uh, at Mount Auburn in Boston, I see this only being more important, and, and I think uh, we're not working with enough cemeteries, Joe. That's all I can tell you. I, I agree. I, I think that, as Frank said it in the intro, now more than ever, cemeteries are being considered these vital green spaces, and the management that's applied to them is being that much more considered about how it's executed. I think we have an opportunity here to reform some of these management practices that have been long entrenched because of the reconsideration of these landscapes and their value. So um, I hope this is adopted by any cemetery that could find it appropriate to use, for sure. Um, Aaron Smith asks, excuse me, are there concurrent studies done with the relationship between grass and trees? I'll say not at Greenwood. Not at Greenwood. Uh, but we are, we're doing studies of our trees with, with other collaborators. But Frank, are there studies that look at the relationship between grass and trees? Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, you, you, you really don't have an urban grassland without some trees, right? I mean, you don't have an urban grassland without some trees. Uh, and generally, <laughs> you have to have one or the other. If you want a really healthy grassland, you need a minimal amount of trees that allow some light. Uh, the more dense the canopy gets, uh, the role that grasses play in an ecological succession is that they grow themselves out of a job. I mean, their job is to essentially get that landscape established into organic matter at the surface, right? Soil organic matter, and then somebody comes in, somebody, somebody, somebody or some bird or some animal drops seed, and it starts to grow, and next thing you know, it's all trees. So there's enormous numbers of studies done on the interaction of these things, but uh, mostly they've been... <laughs> The, 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 the incompatibility of, of the grasslands with a heavy tree canopy. Trying to make it work together. Yes. Um, will there be another winding path sculpted in the meadow of the Hill of Graves? Yes. I believe there will be. I think so as well. Are you hoping that the knowledge gained here will spread beyond cemeteries to other urban grasslands like college campuses and even residential lawns? Absolutely. 100%. In fact, before we got involved with Greenwood back in 2009, uh, Cornell University here in Ithaca was uh, actively looking for ways to be more sustainable, which was code for we have less money, what can we do less of? And I raised my hand in a meeting and said, I think we can mow less. And we, so we've taken about, oh, I would say we've taken about 15% of the campus uh, and, and mow it twice a year. Uh, we've taken about 35% of the campus and mow it once a month. Um, and we have our highest profile piece of property, Live Slope, for those of you that know Ithaca at all, is about 10 acres of uh, perpetual meadow now. So we've tried to do this. This is a growing movement. Um, there is fear. Some people look at it in urban settings. Oh, am I going to have more tick problems? Are going to be more issues with that? And so obviously there are, you know, there's some of that we have to deal with. Uh, uh, but in general, we have started 
starting to see this become more popular and, and in and other the goal, landscapes. The well. larger picture here is this concept that Frank and I and Sarah and all our collaborators are looking to develop, which is this Urban Grasslands Institute concept, where we use Greenwood as a hub, basically, to promote and disseminate the information, the research that we're developing at Greenwood because of its applicability to all the other sites within urban environments. From and, 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 yeah, and our plan this summer, up until the pandemic, was to bring a student intern down uh, from Cornell that was going to start doing some outreach for the Institute, for the idea of, hey, here's what's going on at Greenwood. Let's take some, let's look at the soils at Central Park. Let's look at the soils of these things. Let's go around with the ground staff and other people that might have interest uh, in those other grasslands. So we were going to start to begin to take the early steps of that, but we have the academic interest on the plant and soil side that I think a lot of landscapes have lacked. They've had a lot of stuff in the sort of social side, but not as much as this side. I, I think we are going to offer a really unique opportunity to study this thing uh, for a long period of time in partnership with the other parks, uh, the wonderful New York City parks uh, that, are, that are throughout the city. Frank, we've reached the end of our hour here. Folks, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, really thrilled to be able to talk to Frank and uh, have him share some of the research that we're doing. Thank you very much for coming out and we'll uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you all very much. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.